This conference will now be recorded. Very good. All right, folks. So good afternoon. We're here in class and we're doing chapter five. So chapter five is the skeletal system. And I'm going to I want to show you something interesting, I think is interesting at least. Let's take a look here. So All right, so what I'm putting up here is an, showing you some Google images of ankylosing spondylitis. And I'm looking for a specific image that we're going to see in just a moment. Let's, let's show you this first. So let's, I want to show our online class. So take a look at this part of the, the screen right at the moment there. Let me get it for our class. So folks on, on uh, the computer here and watching, so we're, we're concerned about this image right here, ankylosing spondylitis. So folks, you'll see this image right here, and we're talking about skeletal system today, and we'll finish it up on Tuesday of next week. So we're looking at what's going on with the bones and the skeletal system, the, the skeletal structure. We, we get it that the skeletal system provides support, provides an area for anchoring of structures, uh, in particular, the skeletal muscle to allow for us to be able to move voluntary control, right? Skeletal muscle and protection also of our organs and such. So as we look in the back there, you're seeing that we have the the, the skull, right? And we have the skull cap. And if we were to remove that, the the, the uh, a model of the brain would be in there, right? Um, and understand that, like as we're looking at the thoracic cavity and the ribs, that's what's protecting the major organs there. We can see the spine, which would be protecting the spinal cord and its contents and allowing for nerves to come off of the spinal cord in order to allow for communication uh, between the brain, the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and all parts of the body and such, and the, the organs and such. And we're seeing also that um, you have the upper and lower extremity and the ability to be able to, with the skeletal muscle use, do things with our walk, ambulate. We're able to walk and run, jump. We're able to carry and pull and push, right? So let's see here. There we go. There we go. No problem. Now, what we're going to talk about and what we're just looking at here is that there are situations where we can have uh, genetic disorders that can take place that can actually cause uh, changes present within the skeletal system. So you all have heard of arthritis. Have you all heard of arthritis, right? So what, what's something that you can tell me about arthritis? Go ahead. Yeah, okay, yeah. So pain can be related to its arthritis. Go, what else? Inflammation, right. So an itis, an I-T-I-S, an itis, and that would be a, a suffix at the end of a word that represents an inflammation, inflammatory process. That can also be indicative of an infection. Understood? Okay, so very important to keep that in mind. So the arthritis, arthritis, so what you tell me and someone else now, someone else answer, what type of arthritis, arthritis, or different types of arthritis do you know of that you have an idea of? Tell, tell me and let's write it on the board. Just to shout it out. Rheumatoid. Rheumatoid, okay. So you've heard that one. So rheumatoid arthritis. How about another one? Osteoporosis. So scoliosis, okay. So that's a that's a skeletal disorder and more of a curvature type of an issue okay so like if if we're talking about and we'll get into detail with this but just to give you an example so here we have so we're looking at someone from behind right and in the case of someone with a scoliosis They can have a curvature. As I'm looking at you standing straight. So, what's your first name? 
Ben, Ben, stand, stand up for me, facing me. Good. So if I were to look at Ben, and if I were to go behind him, so actually, Ben, face the, face the wall. Do you mind? Do you don't mind? And so, do you mind if I touch your back? Okay. So, so if I were to palpate down Ben's spine, right, right, and if if his spine were to kind of go like that, that would be scoliosis. His it's straight, right? That's not a problem. Now there are different things we can do as far as X-rays and such, be able to view and see. Thank you, Ben, very much. What's going on? That's scoliosis. Scoliosis can be uh, can contribute to arthritis. In particular, osteoarthritis. Have you ever heard of uh, degenerative joint disease or wear and tear type arthritis? That's what this is, folks, right here. That's that we call a DJD, degenerative joint disease. That's the wear and tear arthritis that 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 we'll all have experienced to some extent. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, understood. Yeah, some people, folks, right? So some some patients, and I'll I'll show you this maybe later today or tomorrow, uh, next next class, that with a scoliosis, they'll they'll actually have like it'll look kind of like hunched a bit and a bump in their spine and such. But yours is minimal. I have my my one of my daughters, she has scoliosis and the same kind of thing, just minimal. But yeah, it's That's present and genetic and such. So you exercise. So. You are so if you have scoliosis, by the way, you're predisposed to having issues with your back over someone who does not have scoliosis present. Okay, so getting back to this ankylosing spondylitis, what'll happen is that over time there's inflammation that takes place, and there can actually be a fusion that can become of the spine. And so, if the spine were to be fused, do you think that that would improve their ability, their range of motion, their ability to move around and such? Absolutely not. It, it's going to be the opposite. It's going to really limit the patient's ability to to move, indeed. So, yeah. So these different arthritides and such. Uh, and and by the way, so osteoarthritis is something that you would um, experience as a result of maybe having an injury to a part of your body, or just as a result of age over time, or um, yeah, those those are the contributing factors. And you could be predisposed, like say, if a family member had quite severe osteoarthritis, you could also be a candidate for more of a severe case of osteoarthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, and that is a case where we have more of what's going on as far as a um, situation where it's um, autoimmune, right? Autoimmune disease. So it's an arthritis and it's an inflammatory process in the joints and such, but it can affect systemically throughout the whole body, not just in certain areas. And rheumatoid arthritis, again, it's autoimmune. What, what do you know, class here? What do, you, what do you think when you hear the term autoimmune? What do you think, Agnes? It's not genetic, something that happens Well, it, yeah, so there could be, so it could be, it could be genetic, I have to tell you, right? So, but it is a process that for whatever reason, um, we don't know the body is doing what to itself is it it's attacking itself right yeah it's causing it's causing an immune process treating your own self as if it were something that's non-self that's and that's an autoimmune disease indeed yeah so that's not a good thing so your immune system is fighting your own cells and tissues and that's bad yeah, that's not good. And that really, so multiple sclerosis, that's an autoimmune disorder, right? So these, these autoimmune disorders can be really quite severe. Now understand that, just like with any other condition that we can experience, any other type of disease, we'll say that there can be mild, moderate, and severe presentations of an illness. Mild, moderate, and severe. Yeah, go ahead. That's the same one as the osteoarthritis. Yeah, there are more. We'll talk about that, but not, not right at the moment. But that just those are like the two big ones that we'll, I want to give you just to have you understand that with 
the spine and with the skeletal system, we can end up having some, some issues that can occur that can really debilitate a patient, really have a person be very limited in, as to what they can do. So let's just go back to our PowerPoint now and let's take a look here. But that's just giving you an example of a couple of conditions that you'll see with the skeletal system. Yeah, so you know, and we don't know, right? So it could be as a could be triggered as a result of an accident. So let, I'm going to write a word on the board here for you all that I'd like you to know. And if we know it from the beginning, I think that's a good thing. Okay. And this word that I'm writing on the board is called E T I O L O G Y. You know, how, how do you think that's pronounced? Etiology, etiology, all right? This is trying to understand the cause. There are many times in, in healthcare that we do not know the etiology to an illness, to a disease process and such. Just want you to know. Sometimes we do. So like in the case of, say like rabies. Rabies, it's as a result of a virus, okay? Now, there can be more of a presentation as far as, well, did, were you bit by something like, say, like a bat, right? That kind of a thing, or or not a possum. Possums don't carry rabies, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, they're they're immune to that, yeah. Um, but how about uh, something like a, like a raccoon? Now, that could carry rabies, or a dog, right? So these, these are, so etiology, the cause of some type of disease process. All right, now let's get into the uh, the skeletal system here. We talked a little bit on uh, last class. We discussed a little bit about the basics of bone. We said that bone is a connective tissue. Bone works in conjunction with primarily cartilage and ligaments. Do you remember this, that ligaments attach bone or connect bone to bone, ligaments. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Cartilage is what can be on the surface of bone in order to prevent bone from rubbing on bone, okay? So that those are two important uh, things that you should know about bone. We looked at the cells, and then we stopped at compact, remember this, compact and spongy bone. All right, so we're gonna move on today. So compact and spongy bone is where we, so let's start the our PowerPoint here. This is chapter five, skeletal system, compact and spongy bone. Okay, thank you. So compact and so compact bone. So think of hello. No, it's it's real hard, right? It's very hard. Okay. Bone is very dense, it's hard, but it's living tissue. Remember, I said that bone is highly vascular. A lot of blood supply in bone. So if you fracture a bone, will it bleed? Yes, it'll bleed. Okay. So highly vascular. Yeah, indeed, understood. But even still, no matter how, what, like so, yeah. So like a hairline fracture, it's still a hairline. It's like there's still a, a break in the bone, so there can still be minimal bleeding, but still bleeding. Oh, okay, understood. Yeah, so then you're thinking of more of like a compound type fracture that it's actually coming out through the skin and not staying uh, within. Um, so compound, compact bone, dense, right? Spongy bone, when I think of a sponge, I think of holes, do I not? I think of a sponge, it's got a lot of holes in it and such, so it's porous. So there's. So remember that, if I said that that bone is very, is vascular, that means that there's going to have to be blood vessels passing through. So in compact bone, there'll be holes that the blood vessels are gonna be passing through. In the case of spongy bone, it's gonna be where there, there are actually these holes through these little like lattice of bone. Do you, do you know what a lattice is? Does anybody know? Let, let me show you this. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah, so take a look over here. So when you think of a lattice,
So we try to do this like underneath your deck to prevent anything from like sleeping underneath your, like a skunk that I've had many stupid skunks underneath my porch <laughs> anyway. Oh Lord, I hate skunks. Okay, well, you have 10 minutes, I'll talk about that. They are cute, but it's stinky. So, <laughs> and it penetrates through everything in your home. Holy cow. Oh, I hate skunks, sorry. What's that? There you go, understood. Under and they are real cute. So lattice. So do you see though, like, so imagine the black, the black lines, imagine that that's, those are like rods of bone. And imagine then you can have, here we go. You can have blood vessels passing through the holes. Does that make sense, right? I, I'm gonna actually step out into the office for a moment. I'm gonna get a model to show you guys. I think it's a cool model. Give me, give me like two minutes, right back. Hey. All right, folks, so let me show the uh, online class here. So this is a model of spongy bone. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, so we're going to pass this around the room. So this is going to be, so we're going to look at that. Yep, so pass that around. So inside the bone shaft, we're going to see it on the ends of bone. Spongy bone. Wait, right? so is it like at the ends of our fingers? I'll show you. I'll show you where we're going to see this. So take a look here. So look up on the board. Let me put this image for our online class. Next slide. So here we have there's spongy bone. Here you're seeing spongy bone here, right? At the ends of bone and such. The inner lining of the bone. It's right here, spongy bone. So take a look over here, spongy bones here. Here we have the compact bone. So if we take a cross section of the, of the long bone, in the inner portion of that bone where there's a cavity, there's a space, and then there's this spongy bone and then compact bone, okay? We'll, we'll look at some models and such, not today, but next time. But here you're seeing compact spongy bone. And you're also seeing here different structures present within the bone that allow for holes in the bone that allow for these blood vessels to pass through. Okay. You're seeing here, there's holes present allowing for those blood vessels to pass through. And then, one second, and then you'll see again in the spongy bone, see how there's all those holes? The blood vessels pass through the holes. Question. Okay, what's the question? It, does more blood pass through the spongy bone than like normal, normal? Uh, what I would tell you is that no, not necessarily. No, because there's, there's, see all these holes right here? Yeah. All blood vessels are passing through those. So there's a lot of blood passing through it, yeah. All right, folks, so take a look up here. So now we're going to look at as far as going over what goes on as far as the, particular structure. And you'll see here that first off, bone develops on a cartilage model. So in other words, there is a model of what's called hyaline cartilage. Remember, I, do you recall that I said that there are three types of cartilage? Well, the hyaline cartilage is the one that really the, the, the majority of your, your skeletal system is the foundation it like it starts off as that cartilage and it becomes bone so a little one that's developing inside its mother right it starts off as the skeleton is like this cartilage and then it becomes it chain transforms from cartilage to bone of of the, the skeletal system really yeah so the bone develops on a cartilage model let's see in the next slide so take a look at here yeah let's i'll come back to this slide 
but I want to show you this. So you'll see here that this long bone, and this is a lower leg bone called the tibia. Class, look over here, those of you in class here, take a look at this model. And you'll see that, let's look at this one. Okay. So this bone right here that my finger's on, right? This bone right there, that's the tibia. And this part right here, you all can feel that bump. And some of you might have had, has anybody ever experienced osgood Slaughter's disease at all? osgood Slaughter's? It's a, it's a disease process where it'll, this area, this bump right here will become very inflamed, like, like a really big bump. <laughs> Oh. I didn't know my voice was so high. No. <laughs> so do, do me a favor. Do, do me a favor. Everybody, touch your knee, touch your kneecap, hold your patella, and then go a little bit inferior to it, and you're going to feel a bump. You're going to palpate that bump. That's the tibial tuberosity of your tibia, that lower leg bone. That's the leg bone that you're seeing right up front on the, on the image here. So, so what, what's that? Yeah, that's the top. Yeah, that's the most superior part right there. That bump. So, shh, so listen up. So this, and actually, so I'm going to show you one, one more thing before. Let me come back here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or just come up. Come on up. Come on up for a moment. It's okay. Come on up. So. So this is the bone, that's the, that's the bump right there. That's the tibia, okay? Now, this is the right side. Look at this, see this piece right here? This piece right here. If you were to point the to your inner ankle, you'd be pointing at that part of your tibia. Yeah, so it's really not, it's really not an ankle bone per se. Really, your foot, right? Your foot has many bones in it and such. And so, yeah, it's kind of weird, but, it's the end of these two bones that you have, you would point to your ankle. It's not really like, no, it's part of like the joint of the ankle, but that's only at the end of a long bone. Yeah, okay. All right, let's go back up to the front here. All right, so just to show you that, on this image, you're seeing that we start off with this hyaline cartilage and it becomes bone over time. A lot of blood flow, blood vascularity to contribute to this, we would say this ossification, this bone production that's taking place, converting bone, cartilage to bone. Okay. Actually, I want to go back to this slide for one moment here. Ah, let me go back just for a moment here. So, this term, epiphysis, epiphysis, this has to do with the end of long bone, the epiphysis. So where I showed you where I pointed to like on those two long bones, the tibia and also what's called the fibula, the ends, you would say that uh, that's your ankle, if you were to point at your ankle, right? That the end, that would be called the epiphysis, the ends of long bone. So on both ends, epiphysis. You know, you would think so. <laughs> you would think so. That there's got to be that the the word root, yeah, has to come from like Latin, yeah. So take a look at the next slide here. Okay, the term remodeling. Do you remember when I said to you all that bone is living tissue? The bone is living tissue, right? Hard but it's living tissue, full of blood, a lot of blood, okay? Know that, and I did say to you that, bone is being replaced, old bone is being replaced by new bone. This is called remodeling, right? So bone tissue is constantly remodeled, right? And you'll see here that it helps bone tissue become resilient, less likely to become brittle and break, okay? Now, do you think this remodeling is slower when as you get older 
Yeah, unfortunately, right? And so who do you think, what population is very susceptible to, to fractures? The elderly. the elderly, right? Or older population indeed, right? Now, one of the things that you can do in order to protect your bone and, and to keep it strong is to put do weight-bearing exercises, an exercising period. Because if you exercise, I want you to know that the stress that you place upon bone makes it stronger. So you repeat that to me. What, what did I just say? Stress upon bone makes it stronger, okay? So, so here's the thing. So think about this for a moment. Um, I really like martial arts and I like mixed martial arts and all that kind of stuff, right? That's for me, I enjoy that. And start, part of like the, the practice and training would be to punch objects punch, right? Punch objects. And what you're doing by doing that is not just kind of trying to hurt yourself, right? By punching a hard object that's a, got a little bit of padding on it, but some no padding, right? They're trying to actually strengthen the bones in the hand and in the arm by putting stress upon it. And by putting repeated stress upon it, they're able to strengthen the bones. So that this way, um, have you ever seen, this is a pretty interesting thing, um, a person being able to kick a baseball bat, a baseball bat, being able to kick it with their tibia, with their shin bone, and break the baseball bat. That's not, you or I do that, and you're going to have a, two pieces to your tibia. <laughs> it's not going to be a one-piece bone, right? But people that train, so they do Muay Thai boxing and such, and they're doing this kickboxing, they're able to train and strengthen that bone so much that it's so dense that it can that it can break a baseball bat. Question hundred. Bo Jackson, yes. <laughs> I didn't know he did that. Holy cow! He was a, he was a pretty strong. He's very athletic, very strong, and uh, and so what can happen also is that so there are people like in professional wrestling, right, or fighters, okay, also that will strengthen their skull by doing headbutts, right. How about those in soccer? They're also doing things with, with their head and neck so that it really strengthens the musculature as well as the, the spine and the bones. Um, by doing things repeatedly and such, they can really train so that stress upon bone makes it stronger. Question. <laughs> so so it's, it's kind of like a thing where you're, where you're in training, you're not trying to damage yourself, right? So, you know, you wouldn't be taking like a cinder block and going, because <laughs> then you'd have, a, you'd have a fracture, you'd have, you know, yeah, but you, you can slowly work up to where you're building up to things that, that can make the bone denser over time. Indeed, yeah. Wait, so people yeah. who are able to, like, karate chop, like, wood and, like, cinder blocks and stuff, they just have dense bones in them? Well, part, well, technique, right, technique, the way to do it right or wrong, right? Um, and also the density of, from training, they're able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. They are, so, so those that hit it with their head, they're quite dense. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, so, all right, so when, when bone is subjected to mechanical stress, right, it's gonna, it's gonna what, what does it say here? More bone is deposited than removed, and so that's gonna make it stronger. That, that was my point. Okay, next slide here. All right, so adult skeleton, 206 bones. Red marrow, yellow marrow. I talked to you about red and red marrow and yellow marrow, right? Right. So it's in the shaft. It's inside of, and it's also at the ends of bone, right? And what it's doing is red marrow produces blood cells. Red marrow produces blood cells. What does it produce? Good. Yellow marrow, adipose tissue. It's fat. Yellow marrow is what? Good. Adipose tissue, it's fat. Correct. And so it's an area for storage for nutrients and such, right? It's an area also that, interesting enough, this yellow marrow, can it become red marrow? If needed, it can. So if needed, the yellow marrow can be converted to red marrow to produce more blood cells and such. So that's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Sure, yeah, go for it. 
So in the case of There's no weird questions, only weird people. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, I'm only kidding. So go for it. Yeah. Would their yellow marrow turn to red marrow? Hmm. So with leukemia, really, it's a case of that their immune system is is so out of whack, so to speak. In that, and we'll talk about this that there are the white blood cell count very very high. Yeah. So it's the white blood cell count. So the white blood cell count. But how do we produce? How do we produce the white blood cells? Red marrow, right? That's the bone marrow is producing these cells. Yeah. So this is why. So this is why. Let's think about this for a moment. And I think I mentioned this to you all. A bone marrow transplant. What's going on there? Well, if my immune system is beginning in more a portion of it in the red marrow, if I put healthy, good marrow into that area, will I then kind of like do like a, a reboot of the immune system and create healthy immune cells? That's the hope, correct? Doesn't always work, but it can work though. And it's quite amazing. I mean, think about how amazing it is that it does work, really, for these people. So quite remarkable. So red and yellow marrow, ligaments and tendons. We talked about these, right? Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone, right? Right, now, here what I wanna point out to you here is that, see the cavity? There's a specific term, we call it the medullary cavity. It's a cavity. You just need to know it as a cavity, right? This cavity is gonna contain vascularity, blood vessels, as well as the bone marrow. And then you're gonna see here that, even at the ends of bone, marrow is present. So marrow can be present within the spongy areas where there's vessels passing through those holes and such. Marrow can be present there also. And look at with the term epiphysis, ends of bone, the ends of bone, the epiphysis. So this next slide, pretty much, folks, you, you should kind of have an understanding of this or think about this for a moment. And I'm gonna, I want to point out something to you in particular, number four. Question. Oh yes, yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't meant if I didn't say that. Yes, correct. So, like at the ends of the bone, red marrow. Everywhere else, yellow marrow. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, red marrow at the ends, yellow marrow in between in that medullary cavity. Take a look at number four here on this. So we get the movement, support, protection, blood cell formation, we've talked about that. But how about this mineral storage? This is interesting. So do you recall that I said remodeling takes place, right? We're continually um, breaking down old bone and replacing with new bone, okay? Well, minerals are present within the bone. I was getting hot and I'm like, why am I getting hot? Because Ooh. Fanny is not on. There we go. All right. I love my fan. There we go. All right. Ah, that feels oh, much better. Much, much better. <laughs> I'm very hyper, so I'm always like, yeah. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> so the mineral storage. So calcium in particular. So you see calcium and phosphorus. So calcium is important for your nervous system to function, right? and for your muscles to contract. So write this down. Calcium is important. Calcium is important for your nervous system and for your muscles to contract. Calcium, very important, okay? And so we need a lot of it is what I'm trying to say. We need a lot of calcium. So if we need a lot of something, cal calcium for the, for the uh, nervous system and muscles to contract. So if we need a lot of calcium, should not we have a place where, where the body, when it needs it, it can just say, hey, I need some calcium and take calcium and use it. Does this make sense? So look at our skeleton back there. It's pretty big, right? I mean, think about it. It's all throughout the whole body. You have bone, right? A good majority of the body, right? There's, there's bone everywhere. If the body needs extra calcium, it's going to pull from that. 
And how does it do that? By breaking down bone. By breaking down bone. And it like, we're, so do you see how like, it's pretty cool that we're like recycling parts within our body? And then we replace it over time. Because what do you do as far as when you're eating? You're taking in nutrients and some of them are higher than others of in the form of calcium, right? So whether it's milk, whether it's green, dark leafy vegetables and such, right? Right. These are all going to be high in calcium. There's other nuts and such too, but calcium is very important. And if you eat a good diet, you really don't need to do calcium supplementation, right? But you have to eat a decent diet and you should be eating fruits and vegetables as well as, you know, and other nutrients and such, but calcium really important. So it's good that we have, we have a bank. We have a bank that we can remove from, take withdrawals from, and that's called the skeletal system. So that's why number four, their mineral storage, that's important for you to see that. All right, now for lab work, I provided for you both classes on um, documents and resources. You'll see that there's a list of the bones that you'll have to know for lab quiz number one, okay? Lab quiz number one, you'll have to know certain bones. Again, you're gonna have a, what's that? Yeah, so it's going to be, it's on the, yeah, but, it, and it's on, I have a list of them also in, in not in Cengage, but in documents and resources. So, yep. which students would like to memorize the right ones, right? Or do we need to memorize? Yeah, you should, no, so you're going to have to commit to memory a, a bit because yeah. I'm, you're, I'm just going to give you terms and you're going to have an image to look at or a model to look at and you have to be able to identify it. And yes, you'll have the terms there, but there's a lot of terms. So, you know, you can get confused. So you yeah. should try to commit to memory some of these, you know, these bones. Absolutely. I think that's important for you to know that. So, so in particular, like, so what is this bone right here? The upper arm bone, upper arm bone is called the humerus, humerus. Okay. That's one. How about the femur? You know what the femur is, right? That's the big leg bone, right? The big thigh bone, we would say, right? So the kneecap, the kneecap is called the patella, the patella. Okay. Yeah, it's called the patella. Yeah, so so this this image here is a good image for you to to look at and to give you an idea. You'll see here also. You're seeing here on the lower left of this image, showing you ligaments. Ligaments what connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. But see, like I repeat it, you you get it over time, right? And that's important. All right, so the next slide here discusses the axial skeleton. So we have the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Now, when you think of an appendage, you think of what? Upper and lower leg, right? The, up, the arms for the upper, the lower for the legs, right? So the axial makes up the body's vertical axis. So the skull protects the brain, the facial bones, support and shape the face and the spinal bone, the, the, the spinal bones, the backbone, the vertebral column. This is all a part of the axial skeleton. Let's take a look at an image here. So on the lab quiz, there's a couple, there's a few of these bones, right? These major bones that you'll have to be able to know, right? So what's your forehead? The frontal bone. This bone right here. So everybody take your hand, take your hand, take your hand, touch the back of your head. The back of your head, that's the occipital bone, occipital bone. How about, see where your ears are, feel your ears, right? And so just go right up above them, the temporal bone. Your temples, your temples, right? And then a little bit above that is the parietal bone. Your mandible is your jaw and the maxilla is above it and then then here right here right so what what would this so your nose right your nose wah, 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 wah. Your, your nose right so <laughs> hyaline cartilage hyaline cartilage is right there at the tip hyaline cartilage but above above where it's hard right at the ridge of your nose that's a bone it's called the nasal bone makes sense that's your nose the nasal bone go ahead now. Sure. 
Yes, indeed. And so we can even take bones from like the pelvis. There, there you can take bones from areas. Yes, absolutely. And and knowing that, say again, what's that? That's correct. Yeah, we can take we can take blood vessels, veins, from the lower leg and use them for the heart. Yeah. So it's amazing what we can do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty wild what we can do. So let's move on. Let's look at this next image of the skull. We're looking at the inferior aspect, and this is a big hole. See this big hole? So that's where the, the spinal cord will then exit, right? And that big hole is called a foramen is a hole. A foramen is a hole. Can you write that down? Foramen, F-O-R-A-M-E-N, foramen. Foramen is a hole. So if I say foramen magnum, that's a big whopping hole, right? That's a big hole. Foramen magnum, big hole. Now, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Just, we're, we're not taking a break. We're just standing up for a second. I mean, if you have to use the bathroom, do it. But we're just like, this is like a 30-second stretch. All right, there we go. All right, good. Awesome. 30 seconds. <laughs> That's not bad if you can do that. Yeah. All right, have a seat, please. So you can see here on this inner, this um, inferior aspect of the skull, there are quite a few holes. These holes are going to allow for blood vessels and nerves to pass through. Okay. Yep. Let's move on. Next slide we're going to see. Next slide we're going to see. So within the uh, facial and skull bones, we're going to have some spaces available, right? These are called a sinus or sinuses, okay? And we know this because we can have a sinus infection and this is not fun and it can be filled with fluid and different uh, mucus, overproduction of mucus. What do you think sinuses, like what's the purpose of a sinus? Why would we have sinuses present? What do you think? I'm not really sure, but like I heard that it helps to protect just like the gut or like the... Okay. And so, like in protect, mucus production, get infected and such. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Because respiratory system. And and think also that sinuses are spaces. So instead of having solid bone, there's a lot of spaces present. So this kind of also helps the skull to not be as heavy. Good. Okay, that no, it's no, no, not bad thinking, but no, like we're like think digestive system, but but also know that the holes for that that are the passageways that are shared by respiratory and digestive are the same, right? So then there you go, and then and then it's just a matter of when it enters into the digestive system, yeah, then we're going to pull nutrients or not, absolutely. So the appendicular skeleton. Appendicular, All right? So here we're looking at the appendages. So bones that support the limbs, upper chest, shoulders, and pelvis, okay? So we have the pectoral girdle for the chest, shoulders, upper extremity, pelvic girdle for the lower extremity. And so here we have, yeah, phalanges or fingers, there you go. So here we have pectoral girdle, okay? So you're seeing here clavicle, you're seeing here the uh, the scapula, and then the bones of the upper extremity, the humerus, the radius and the ulna, the carpal bones, because you, you all know this, right? Carpal tunnel syndrome, where is it affecting? The wrist, right? So those carpal bones, there's many of them, right? Um, that's make, comprising the wrist. And then we have the metacarpals and the phalanges. So the metacarpals, that's the palm of your hand, metacarpals. The uh, phalanges are the fingers, okay? We said that before. Go for it. No, but, but, but you're still...
We can't hear you. Your mic is off. Professor, we can't hear you. Your mic is off. This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks. So my mic, uh, my wireless mic died. So now I'm just using the mic from the computer itself. So let's see how that works. So recall that I talked to you all in class about synovial joints or hollow joints, hollow joints that are containing this synovial fluid. That's important for you to know, synovial fluid, okay? So it's going to be like the, so when we look at, how about like your elbow, a hinge joint? How about the ball and socket joint of your upper extremity or of your lower extremity, right? As far as the hip joint, okay? So synovial joints throughout your fingers, all the joints in your hand and such, synovial joints. Let's see here. Then we also have cartilage or cartilaginous joints and fibrous joints. So you'll see here that cartilaginous joints, they're going to be limited as far as the kind of movement. So the synovial joints allow for the most movement. Cartilage, cartilaginous joints, a little bit of movement. And fibrous joints, generally no movement. So like your teeth and the socket of your mandible, or your maxilla, yeah, there shouldn't be any, <laughs> if you have movement going on there, that's a problem, right? That's a problem. Um, and you probably have some type of uh, nutritional deficiency in order for that to take place. So here you're just seeing on this next image, you're seeing here that we have just examples of the different types of joints. I'd like you all to be able to take a look at that on your own, please. And here, the next image you're seeing, you're doing, is showing you range of motion, right? Showing you range of motion. And that's the ability for you to move as a result of having these joints present, you're able to move parts of your body. Next image. Let me see more range of motion. Yes, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so there's really no such thing as double jointed, but there is hyper flexibility. Yeah, indeed. So people who are like into like gymnastics and such, right? So they have done as a result. So part of it can be genetic, that they're just able to do it better than others. And part of it's just uh, primarily it's as, as a result of training and stretching and doing what they do in order to get that flexibility and such. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so here's the thing. Um, Becoming flexible and, and being able to stretch is really good, but making sure also that the muscles are tight enough and strong enough in order to be able to secure those joints. So here's something. How many of you in class, if you want to raise your hand for this, how many of you in class have an area of your body when you move it, it clicks? How many of you it clicks? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So when it does that, all right. So that's is that a good thing? It's not a good thing. Sorry, you're all screwed now. I'm not kidding. 
<laughs> Sorry. No, but but he, hold on, I'll I'll get to it. So here's the deal, right? So here's here's the deal. So areas of your body that are clicking like that, there's something going on where it's it's we would say it's hypermobile. It's moving too much and it's not tight. So the ligaments and the tendons, which should be holding everything nice and tight together, they've been overstretched, they've been damaged. You did something to cause some type of injury to that area, and that's why it does that clicking when you move it. So that's not a good thing. So what do you need to do? One, you should, you should make sure that things are within alignment. Chiropractic is a good thing, right? Number two, you should also make sure that you're training your muscles so that the muscles are tight and strong so they're keeping your joints in place. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So if I have a problem with my knee, I'm gonna strengthen my quadriceps and my hamstrings, the anterior muscles of my, of my thigh and the posterior muscles of my thigh in order to stabilize my knee. Can you understand that or does that make sense to you all? Let's look at the back here. Let's look in the back for a moment. What about the lower body? Yeah, so the lower body, what he's doing. So somehow, you cause some type of instability here, right? And so training, Biceps, triceps, right? Having the areas surrounding the joint, training the musculature surrounding the joint to help stabilize the joint. So then, right. So there is a variable that you pointed out, and that is important. Now, so it can be too tight. So if it's too tight, then you can. So, so, so we can have normal range of motion, normal ability to be able to move parts of our body, right? Can it be hypo mobile? Not moving too much. Or can it be hyper mobile where it's moving too much? Right. Um, why is the normal range telling you that from from my own experience as far as my clinical experience that if you have an area of the body that's clicking even if it's a even if it's asymptomatic no pain there's still that's a problem because it can eventually become a problem question so, so there there are so there are multiple conditions that can go on let's right. we'll leave it at that okay. but know that you can have because there because because honestly you can have multiple things going on right can you have instability of the ligaments on the sides of your d right. can you have um, issues with the ligaments inside like so right so you have anterior posterior cruciate ligament you have the lateral and collateral ligaments right so you have um then even like and then all the muscular uh tendinous insertions that are stabilizing the knees. Do you see how like, can you have problems with the cartilage and meniscus and have that wearing away? Yeah, so there's all these things that can go on. Yes, question. Yeah, 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 so understood, yeah. So, so, but I would tell you that, so there could be issues with, there could be issues with your, where you're, you've been, maybe you've been in a car accident, maybe you've taken, maybe, you've, yeah, maybe you had whiplash, exactly. And so then over time, what, what, what has occurred, what could have occurred is that there could have been, as a result of the whiplash injury, ligaments overstretched, damage to the soft tissue, misalignment of the vertebra, and then chronic problems can occur as a result. Okay, so 
we're, we're going to stop with Dr. Perone analyzing everybody's. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, <laughs> no, but you're right, though. And so thank you for asking. I'm, I'm kidding around here. But I, but, I, but I really want you to understand that, like, so clicking in the bones, in the joints, not a healthy thing, right? So it's not a good thing. And, and so you can be, and here's the thing. Let me get, this is, a, this is a good point to make to you all. Can you be asymptomatic and still be sick? Can you have no symptoms and still be sick? You can. Can I have a cavity be present and I still have no pain? Yeah, over time. Can you experience cancer? Can you have cancer growing in your body and be asymptomatic, no, no symptoms whatsoever? Yes. So can you be sick and be asymptomatic? Yes, you can. So can you, can you have an issue with a joint that it's clicking and it's asymptomatic and it still can be a problem down the road? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So many times our body is trying to talk to us and we're doing this. And we're not paying attention to what's going on with our bodies. And that's true, right? I mean, all of us can, I think, can, can agree to that. We do ignore what goes on with our bodies many times, right? But pain, pain is not a bad thing. Pain is, so in my career of treating patients, right? Pain was a major issue for many of my patients. So chronic pain is no fun, but pain can alert you to problems in your body. And so that's not a bad thing when it tells you, hey, I've got something going on, I better take care of it. Okay. Now, let's look at, let me just see where we're at. Yeah, let's, uh, I'm gonna go over these two slides and then we're done for the day as far as lecture, okay? So osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. Did we talk about osteoarthritis? We did, right? We said, remember we said degenerative joint disease, right? The wear and tear. So write this down, the wear and tear arthritis. Wear and tear arthritis. Or osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. It says cartilage becomes worn away. So that's the wear and the tear. So there can be issues with stress going on with and, and breakdown of the cartilage and the joint gets damaged and such. Osteoarthritis. Osteoporosis. So this is where we have the breaking down of bone is more than the building up of new bone. Does that make sense to you? The breaking down of old bone, that process is taking place more than the building up of new bone. Makes sense, doesn't it, right? Osteoporosis. And this can be a gradual condition. Bone loses mass. So what do you think for our elderly population that we try to get them to do in order to increase the bone density, the bone mass? We have them exercising, exercising in order to do that, right? That's very important. And then there can be other things too as far as different medication, nutrients and such, but really, would we wanna do things to prevent this from occurring? We're trying to be proactive. So diet, right, your nutrition, as well as exercise, can be very important. Last slide for the day. Rheumatoid arthritis we talked about. And so again, this is an autoimmune disease. Carpal tunnel syndrome. This is an area where we can have the bones of the wrist misalign and start putting pressure upon the nerves that pass through that area there, okay? So you'll see caused by repetitive motion. So how about if someone is working in a factory and they're doing the same type of things all day long, right? That repetitive motion can absolutely cause damage to that area and then cause uh, impingement of nerves, which can lead to much discomfort. Go ahead. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yep. Doing that for hours upon a day. Yeah, no matter what it is that you do in a day, you need to get up every once in a while and walk around and move around and do something different for a bit. Yep, absolutely. All right, folks, we'll finish this chapter up on Tuesday. Very good. This conference will now be recorded.